humanity has thrust itself into an alien war so brutal that there are no signs of winning. Keiji Kiria, a pathetic tool, is also a pawn in this war. Keiji, in his hopelessness, experiences his first ever battle, thinking it would be all smooth, sitting at the back like a sneaky little sniper. He realizes this ain't CSGO or Valorant, when the aliens jump his dumb ass, killing him in a painful way. Just when he thought his life had ended, Keiji mysteriously finds himself returned to the previous day, maintaining memories of the events. Thus begins a cycle of suffering, where Keiji has to find any means to survive, and outlive the cursed alien time loop in this hellish war. In the midst of a bloody war, against the terrifying aliens called the Mimics, a warrior lies defeated in his final moments. Reed of Rataski accompanies this man, aiming to stay by his side until the end. Enter Keiji Kiria, a young soldier who wakes up to the sound of the transmission for duty. Keiji's dream just now seemed terrifying and unusual, and he could even remember gruesome details like losing his arm. Bro experienced Vegeta's pain when he got smoked by Android 18. Keiji is told to sign a confession letter by his friend Jin Yanabaru for a party just before their first battle. Keiji doesn't understand the tradition or the way this party is supposed to work. Instead, he's focused intensely on the mission ahead. Jin states that they're actually heading out tomorrow. Keiji isn't in top shape, remembering to abstain from drinking the previous night. His friend thinks that he's letting the pressure get to him, while Keiji is truly bothered by the dream he just saw. Specifically, Keiji is a jacket soldier, who is destined to enter his first ever battle. Death and obliteration loom over humanity. Their greatest nemesis is not of their kind, but rather foreign creatures called mimics. These creatures have mysterious backgrounds, but one thing is for certain. They're hell-bent on exterminating humanity. Keiji's younger self describes the experience as being a part of a sci-fi story for most people. However, since he'd become accustomed to their perilous attacks, Keiji wasn't surprised. To defend against these monsters from destroying humanity, the United Defense Force was created. But after a long, agonizing war, their resources have been stifled a great amount. Okinawa is in jeopardy and completely overtaken by the mimics. Other continents like Europe and Africa are no different, and they are slowly falling victim to the mimics' wrath. An influx of the mimics had already circled Japan for a full-scale attack. The front lines of this battle are located in the Boso Peninsula. To combat these creatures, Japan took the technological route, enhancing an armor called the Battle Jackets. To protect the manufacturing of such armor, a special military unit has been dispatched from the U.S. Special Forces, under the command of Rita Vrataski. Rita's team is the most effective unit when it comes to destroying the Mimics. Keiji is excited yet nervous about fighting alongside Rita's unit in his first experience on the battlefield. Jin comforts him to take it easy. He thinks that the only people who return from the battlefield are messed up in the head, as one would expect from such a terrifying war. Jin's skin grows pale when he sees Sergeant Bartolome creeping from behind. Jin eats his words while the sergeant designates them for the training field. The soldiers are startled at first, as if they weren't expecting training beforehand. The sergeant explains that they've found faulty equipment in their gear, and that's not exactly the ideal outcome you would want a day before battle. Keiji thinks that they'll face the consequences via physical training. Jin calls him a clown for making bad jokes, but Keiji tells him that it's just what he saw in his dream. Three hours of painstaking push-ups, in fact. Jin is begging, pleading, crying, whining, everything for his life that this premonition doesn't come to pass. Unfortunately, on the training grounds, they're facing the exact bone-breaking training that Keiji had predicted in his dream. It seems inconceivable at first. An exhausted KG glances over to spot the U.S. Special Forces unit. He spots the baddest b of them all, as well as the strongest jacket soldier in mankind's arsenal, Rita Vretaski. Jin is shocked because she looks tiny, an ant compared to the others. Jin refers to her by her war name, the Full Metal b a killer in the flesh of a tiny girl. Jin thinks that the U.S. Special Forces might be used just for presentation purposes, in order to boost morale and promote international relations. Damn, Jin out here should be collapsing with game theory or something. Keiji is getting a nostalgic feeling, as if he's already seen Rita somewhere before. His constant staring catches her attention as she notices him. Rita draws near him, and with every step, Keiji's heart is about to explode. She requests permission from the base commander to join the training. Rita is granted permission and goes down to business next to Keiji. She cuts right to the chase and asks if there's anything Keiji finds interesting because of his constant staring. Bro is about to catch a very expensive harassment case, lol. Keiji reflects on how she looks no different than an ordinary girl and apologizes for his staring. 
The training concluded in one hour, even though Keiji remembers doing it for three hours in his dream. This signals to him that his dream might hold no significant meaning in the end. That night, after refusing to join Jin and his other friends in their drinking party, Keiji focuses his attention on reading a book. He's shocked because he already knows the contents of the book, despite never having read this far. My guy basically got the spoilers and the leaks from his dream self, haha. Keiji is pressured to fight alongside Rita. He consoles himself, stating that his dream was nothing more than a false vision and that he would return home alive. The following day, the soldiers are geared up in their battle jackets. Their mission is to retake the island from the wrath of the mimics. These Dune Slayer looking battle suits are prepared to make monster spaghetti on the battlefield, or so they think. Taking a position as snipers, Keiji and Jin's job is to take care of the mimics that advance through their main forces. In essence, it doesn't seem like a difficult mission. The real battle is about to begin. Keiji senses the sheer weight of the actual battlefield. He sees a mimic and immediately pulls the trigger. The bullets rain heavily on the creature before their eyes, but to what effect is the question. Horrifying monstrosities emerge past the main forces, having destroyed everything in their path. Jin Yanabaru is obliterated to pieces before Jeiji's eyes. His body split in half and his guts were on the ground. Does the description remind you guys of a particular character? Hint, go. Keiji can barely take a moment to process the situation at hand. When a mimic shoots a death javelin right at him, rupturing his arm to pieces. Keiji faces extreme agony, repeatedly whining about how badly it burns, hurts, and stings his body. Despite his whining, the human thinks that it is meaningless as death is soon to approach him. The final image of his life flashes right before a mimic crushes his body, or so he thought. Enter Keiji Kiria again, a cadet soldier who has just woken up after having a dream, or was it a dream? Keiji contemplates what happened, as the events of his previous life take place exactly the way they did. Keiji vividly remembers how he died, to the point he gets sick and vomits on the floor. Keiji thinks that it's impossible for what he saw to be a dream, when the experience feels so real. Keiji realizes that the battle is going to take place tomorrow. He confirms his thoughts through the book he read, realizing that he hadn't even gotten up to this point, and yet he remembers everything. The surreal situation strikes him in a state of panic and anxiety, unable to comprehend the reality laid before him. Jin wonders what's going on with him. Keiji remembers his dream about being killed, and his arm shot clean off. He wonders if the first dream he had also wasn't a dream, and only one conclusion remains. It is an undeniable fact that Keiji Kiria faced death twice. Keiji, like any sane human, wants to avoid his death. In a state of panic, he runs away from the room, running as fast as he can outside where he is safe. On his way, he bumps into Rachel Kisaragi, hurting himself in the process. Keiji tells her that he's okay, and tries to run off, despite the bleeding wound. Sergeant Bartolome realizes that Keiji became responsible for causing a mess out of potatoes, and takes note of the boy's scratch. He tells him to skip the training session, and instead get his wound treated. Keiji runs off again, escaping from his base. The thing about deserting his base is that he'll literally get shot down by his people. However, Keiji's desperate resolve and clinginess to life made his escape out of fear. Thankfully, he was able to run far away, so he exhausted every last bit of his strength to find a road that hopefully connects to a town. Keiji thinks that his freedom is within his grasp. He finds a pair of civilians, a grandfather and his granddaughter. Keiji has now confirmed having made out of the base and near the defense zone. Everything feels safe until he sees the man's head fly clean off of his shoulders. Shortly after, the girl also falls victim to the brutal javelins launched by the mimics. When Keiji turns to his right, all he sees is the monstrosity laughing at him. A mimic in this area, Keiji didn't even expect that to be possible. His expectations are shot through his leg and shortly after, he gets impaled so brutally that it results in his inevitable death. Enter Keiji after he's died three times. Keiji wakes up, almost annoyed this time. He takes the gun from Jin Yanabaru and goes all American on this crap. Keiji runs the bullet through his brains, but what do you know, even American gun rights aren't enough to stop the power of bullshit time loop mechanics. Keiji wakes up in his fifth life, having gained a firm understanding of the situation he is placed in. Keiji believes that he's experiencing a never-ending time loop that preserves his memories for unexplained reasons, that he doesn't know why. He asks his friend Jin a strange question about getting one's life reset at the beginning of the game. Jin thinks that he definitely wouldn't want to repeat an operation, even with his life threatened. Keiji's circumstances are horrid, as he can't even die of his own volition to stop his endless pain. He thinks about telling Jin Yanabaru 
and confirms that he's the only person experiencing the time loop. Keiji is the only person in the world who has to get over his fear of death. He musters his resolve and thinks that staying alive is the only method for him to break the time loop. Having died four times in total, Keiji marks the number five on the back of his hand, declaring the beginning of his agonizing war. Keiji reflects on his childhood, play fighting as a hero, who sacrificed his life to protect his friends. He would take all of the hits to allow the necessary forces to defeat the monsters. At the time, Keiji thought that dying was just like how it was in the game. But now, after experiencing gut-wrenching pain four times, Keiji understands the true horror of death. While in his training session, he resigns any thoughts of sacrificing his life in this war. Keiji's only goal is to ensure a successful survival rate on the battlefield. He has identified his goal. But the big question remains, how will he survive against the wrath of indestructible mimics? Keiji spots Rita, the strongest soldier, and remembers seeing a vision of her in his first death. Even though he thought it was a dream, Rita actually accompanied him when he fell. Donning a blazing red jacket with a battle axe, Rita asked him an obscure and odd question at the time of his death. She wanted to know about the custom of green tea. Keiji didn't know the purpose of such a weird question, but it helped regulate his breathing. He asked her about his chances of survival, but Rita outright told him he had none. Rita vowed to stay with him until Keiji's consciousness faded away. He felt comforted while Rita told him to relax against the release of death. The field nearby exploded as Rita prepared to take down a swarm of mimics. Rita was armed for battle and even defeated many of them with her lightning-fast agility paired with incredible strength. She moved like an invincible goddess with each of her swings, signifying her as the goddess of destruction upon the battlefield. During this fight, an already dying Keiji thought that it would be best for him to contribute, instead of waiting around for death. In the process of helping Rita, he got his arm blasted after defeating one of the mimics, experiencing his first death. Keiji admires Rita's abilities and doubts his ability to take down a mimic in a fight. Interestingly enough, in this sequence, Rita didn't join the PT training next to Keiji and instead moved in the opposite direction. This makes Keiji wonder if his influence had something to do with altering the future. Having confirmed that he's capable of changing the future, Keiji discovers newfound confidence in his ability to win. Despite his odds being next to nothing, Keiji thinks that he can play the infinite game and better his chances each time. After the exhausting PT session of three hours, Keiji thinks that he's still a rookie when it comes to his fighting skills. His current objective is to get stronger. He enters the cafeteria to find Jin facing off against his friend, who coaches the numbskull not to rely on his motions, but instead focus on honing his techniques. This conversation further provides enlightenment to Keiji, who realizes that he's got to improve his combat skills to excel further. In the next scene, Keiji walks up to his captain. Sergeant Bartolome has spent quite the years at the base, becoming its most valuable and experienced soldier. Having survived until this point is a testament to his abilities. Keiji asks if he is still following through with his training, as he wants to join him. The sergeant tells him to give it a rest, as it won't be helpful that much. He asks whether or not Keiji has heard of the old samurai saying, that means to strike your enemy and adapt. Bartolome recalls that the legendary swordsman Mashashi killed an innumerable number of men. Their only way of honing their skills was to keep on killing, surviving more than anyone. Keiji realizes that the missing piece of the puzzle is the experience that he lacks in practical combat. He finds himself grinning like a creepy weirdo. Bartolome doesn't know what's up with him. Keiji thinks that if he's capable of perfecting his skills, then he might have a chance because of his broken time loop ability. The soldier is perhaps the only person in the entire world, with all of the time left to train and hone his skills, rivaling those who are above and beyond his level. Bartolome notices a determined and confident look in Keiji's eyes. He tells him to suit up and return in 15 minutes. Keiji asks a stupid question and gets scolded for it. Just when the sergeant has agreed to train him, he's already spoiling his chances. Being stuck in a time loop, the young man has finally discovered the mechanics of this death-defying game. He'll always return to the day before the battle, and has no chance of escaping the inevitable. The only thing he maintains are his memories of the previous iterations. There's also the fact that the same iteration will never have the chance of reappearing. Keiji's best shot at defeating the time loop precisely lies, in fact, in his personal strength. In his twelfth loop, Keiji, instead of running away from the mimics, propels himself forward, facing his fears so that he can gain experience. His training with the sergeant has continued the same. 
Bartolome gave him crucial advice to turn off his auto balancer, allowing for a marginal speed increase. Bartolome believes that every millisecond matters in actual combat, so something so small could amount to great outcomes. On the battlefield, KG thrust ahead, having experienced seven deaths. He's found himself capable of running in any direction. Unfortunately for KG, he finds himself surrounded and jumped by the mimics who shoot him like a billion times to end his life. Now, he wants to give them a taste of their own medicine with a heavy firearm. Though the jacket soldiers possessed big weapons like the rifle, they were actually ineffective against the mimics. This is also true for the explosives and rocket launchers. Instead of long-range weapons, something effective is considered melee and close-range like the pile driver. The weapon is known to be capable of killing mimics. Keiji wants to hone his skills to be able to use them against the ruthless monsters. On the battlefield, he advances toward a mimic in order to defeat the creature. Keiji has the perfect opportunity to strike, but upon seeing the creature's abominable face with gaping teeth, Keiji hesitates and literally gets his head impaled as a consequence. The terrified cadet wakes up yet again after experiencing another painful death. In an effort to overcome his fear of the mimics, he wants to prevent himself from hesitating on the battlefield. Death itself is on the young man's side as he goes through his 21st time loop iteration. This time, he advances without hesitation, plunging a pile driver inside the mimic's body. Progress has been made, and the victory is Keiji's as he's secured his first ever kill without injury. His confidence grows as he realizes that honing his skills more effectively will cause him to defeat the creatures. Keiji saves Jin Yanabaru from the wrath of a mimic and tells him to run away. The other soldiers are stunned to recognize Keiji's combat skills in battle. Keiji's physical abilities had now reached a level that impressed the sergeant. However, it didn't make things any better as he couldn't stop dying. A major obstacle became a reason for that. On his 47th time loop, Keiji tries to invade the weapons facility of the US Special Forces. He has observed the routine of the two guards, who are constantly armed. The problem with his current weapon is that it only has the killing capacity to take down 20 mimics. Keiji couldn't do anything after his ammo ran out, so he's looking for a more viable weapon that doesn't fail him. Already knowing the routine of the guards, Keiji utilizes his swift maneuvering to slip past them undetected. A successful infiltration attempt helps lead Keiji right to his target. A girl working on the battle suit is startled by Keiji's sudden interruption. Shasta finds her glasses and promptly introduces herself. Keiji tells her that he's here for Shasta. The girl acts like he's about to take her hand in marriage or some crap. Keiji tells her to help make him a battle axe of the same caliber as Rita Vretaski. Shasta is surprised by the request and immediately tries to persuade him. She's got her hands full on orders as the first lieutenant who graduated at the top of her class. Shasta is a bona fide genius and is also responsible for handling Rita's personal inventory. She's the mastermind behind their weapons. Keiji uses a bargaining chip, an actual memory unit that Shasta has been seeking all this time. She tries to snatch it from his hands, but Keiji doesn't give it to her easily. Keiji tells her that he's willing to throw it in for a battle axe in return. Shasta emphasizes that he'll get himself severely injured, trying to copy Rita's style. She thinks that no one is capable of wielding such a heavy axe that weighs 200 kilograms. The strength required to swing the axe without crumbling one's body in two is too much for the average person. Rita herself doesn't use the auto-balancer function and refuses to make the slightest of missteps. In fact, Rita's suit is custom-made to remove the auto-balancer function, and she is the only person in her squad who is even capable of accomplishing such a feat. By every standard, she's basically a god. Keiji also thinks that auto-balancer removal would be beneficial. Shasta reasons that he won't become the next Rita and that he misinterprets her immensely. For instance, the first time she met Rita, she said that she was glad to live in a world full of war. Something so terrifying slipped from the mouth of a human being, making her an anomaly among the anomalies. Keiji's deadpan face stays the same, and he agrees that the others misunderstand her. This is because Keiji saw the true Rita, who had accompanied him upon his first death. That's why he thinks she's more than just a robotic warrior. Keiji clarifies that he wants the battle axe because his current weapon is limited. He also doesn't care if the weapon is a spear of some kind. Keiji only cares about survival on the battlefield, no matter what. With his insistent urging, Shasta comments that he's an unusual person and feels nostalgic because Rita said something similar to his words. Keiji considers it a compliment and clarifies that he's got a lot of time to practice, obviously because of his infinite time loop powers. Shasta snatches the chip from his hand and gets to work immediately. 
The forging of the weapon begins at last. Shasta tells Keiji that he's the first person she's ever seen who doesn't fear the ambitious strength of Rita Vrataski. She also doesn't understand why this goofy guy has a number written on his hand. Keiji comes up with an excuse that he's just crossing his days off a calendar or something. Shasta gets curious and wonders if it's really important. Keiji's battle axe is finally complete. He gets to his training right after. Finally, Keiji Kiria will also perhaps tap into his true potential. Or that's what he thought. On the battlefield, Keiji finds it incredibly straining to even swing the battle axe. He dies all the same, starting from the beginning. However, by this point, Keiji has a schedule made for the only day he gets to be alive. The day consists of stealing the cheap, reflecting on his past errors, training and asking Shasta to forge the battle axe, and then training with the sergeant. Not much has changed from his daily routine, and it has come to a point where Keiji's body knows what to do. He even knows the tiniest of details, such as the soup burning Jin's hand. One of the men at the cafeteria praises Rachel's excellent cooking. For Keiji, it's quite the opposite. While the food may have been delicious at first, he's eaten it so many times all the same that he's gotten bored of it. Keiji faces dread and a massive headache, which makes it seem like he's really not enjoying his meal. Two soldiers note the presence of Rita Vrataski, sitting around by herself. Keiji always watches her at this hour. She eats her lunch and drops a bean. Rita's speedy reflexes catch the bean before it hits the ground. Rita proceeds to eat a pickled plum, she didn't expect it to be so sour. Keiji, who is unsurprised to see this happen every day, thinks that her movements are quite childlike, even though she's an adult. Keiji's resting b face attracts the attention of a musclehead, who thinks that he's disrespecting the food. The hotshot tries to gang up on him, and claims that he's acting ungrateful for the food. Keiji wonders if this dude has an actual problem with him, as this has never happened before. The man grabs Keiji by the collar, and yaps in his face. Keiji doesn't do anything, while Rachel tries to disengage from the situation. Keiji sees his damn ugly face on the plate, and thinks that it's only obvious for people to find him annoyed. Rachel tries to give him a free shrimp, but the good-for-nothing muscle head reaches his hand in order to grab Keiji again. Keiji effortlessly dodges the attack, making him crash into the nearest table. Keiji returns the shrimp, while the infuriated man tries to start a real fight with him. The man throws a punch, and all the while, Keiji is channeling his protagonist's monologue, thinking that it doesn't matter because he's infinitely faster. Keiji deploys Ultra Instinct at full throttle, breaking down his movement into fractions for greater agility. In comparison to his real battles, this one seems like child's play to him. Keiji glances at the man's position, and predicts exactly what kind of attack will be launched at him. He has had a million chances to pummel this man straight to the ground, but Keiji keeps evading to avoid getting into trouble. Keiji decides to stop dodging, to take a light punch from the man. However, what he didn't predict was for Rachel to intervene, driving the man's fist straight into his face, and knocking him out. While Keiji's knocked out cold, Rita gets up from her table and praises his fighting skills. The young man wakes up, to find Rachel's beautiful face hovering over him. She apologizes for the trouble caused. Keiji asks if he really had a resting b face while eating. Rachel claims that it made it seem like he was at a funeral. The reason for Keiji's sudden depression is that, in his previous time loop, Keiji's personal onslaught became the demise of his sergeant. Keiji felt crushed under the extreme guilt of having betrayed the man, who had trained him up until this point. He thinks that he should maintain his composure more often. Rachel is curious and asks why he refused to fight back. Keiji feigns ignorance, but she's sharp and knows that he could have defeated the man anytime he wanted. Keiji tells her that he'd rather save his efforts for the real battle. Rachel goes from 0 to 100 and allows this man to have her for a night. She doesn't just say something like that to anyone she sees. Keiji thinks for a moment and rejects her, stating that he's got training to catch up to. If that doesn't speak Sigma male to you, then I don't know what does. This man said he's gotta hit the gym instead. Keiji runs and remembers Rachel's appearance, which is similar to that of a librarian he used to see back in high school. Keiji had a major crush on this girl but concealed his feelings. Even though he was crushed, Keiji joined the military, but didn't expect the war to make anything better. He arrives in the sergeant's training room, remembering the girl's words, which advised him of the importance of life. Keiji thinks that he might have spent the night with Rachel if his life was allowed to end, but now, he has to relive pain and suffering. On his 99th iteration, Keiji is mercilessly impaled by the mimics. In the loops to follow, Keiji's death was mostly related to Jin Yanabaru, the weakest of the group. On his 123rd loop of war, Keiji reflects on having severe migraines, 
the longer the battle goes on. On the 154th iteration, and Keiji's barely clinging to life, he can't maintain consciousness after 80 minutes on the battlefield. This means that he doesn't have a great chance of prolonging beyond his limits. Finally, on loop 158, Keiji saw something. Keiji, who at this point has become a god of destruction in his own right, absolutely annihilated the mimics with his fiery blaze and ferocious assault. Keiji's weapon gives his team a chance of survival. Sergeant Bartolome commands the 17th Company to back him as support, allowing Keiji to take out the forces ahead. Keiji had surpassed human limitations, becoming a machine that manipulated the battlefield with every experience. Reed of Retaska's unit is surprised to see the mimics getting destroyed left and right by the Japanese forces. When Keiji sees a man dying, clinging to his last breath as he is about to pass away, he strikes up a conversation with him to help distract him. It's actually the same thing Rita did with him on his first death. Keiji chats up the fallen soldier, allowing him to get back on his feet. Remembering how Rita saved him at his weakest with the conversation of green tea, Keiji now does the same to others. A cataclysmic boom is seen nearby. Keiji realizes that this is the work of the Valkyrie, who rained destruction wherever she went. With her appearance on the battlefield, the soldiers have finally gained the hope of survival. Rita Vratasca's dominance earned her the name Full Metal Bit out of respect instead of hate. In the same way, Keiji experienced a strange feeling, drawing him near Rita. He forced himself not to find affection, because the time loop would reduce everything to ashes. While Rita's fighting the mimics, Keiji spots the same mimic that he faced in his first ever time loop. Keiji tries to exact his revenge by rushing forth and defeating this creature. However, during this moment, Rita asks him a straightforward question, asking how many loops he has been a part of. The story dives deep into Rita's background. She was born in a small town with a few thousand people. The young girl didn't boast a high performance in academics and was notably picky with her food. She returned to her father after pretending to cry like an Oscar-winning celebrity. The girl didn't boast any special talents that set her apart from the rest of the world. They meet a friend of her father for some coffee. There, Rita's father hears the news of the Mimic's world-ending conquest. He is confident that their landlocked region couldn't be invaded. However, the older man stated that the Mimics are aliens, making the war continue until one side is fully wiped out from existence. Rita denied wanting to join the army because she liked the town and everything about the place she grew up in. That particular night, a heavy hailstorm cloaked everything in white. Rita, disturbed from her sleep, glances at the window. To her bewilderment, she is struck and horrified by what she sees. Her father immediately grabs his daughter in an effort to make an escape. Rita didn't know what was happening, but it became obvious once she stepped outside to see the aftermath of an explosion. Rita's father chucks her down an underground vault where her injured mother is barely clinging to life. Rita assists her mother while her father charges full speed and crashes into a mimic. However, it doesn't even dent the creature's heavy armored skin. The mimic shoots its javelins, destroying the vehicle and forcing him to escape outside. Rita's father realizes just how terrifying the mimics truly are. He can't hurt the monsters to protect his family. So, instead, like a sacrificial father caring for his family, he draws attention to himself. Rita's father gets severely injured, and just before his final moments, bravely tells his daughter to live. Rita's expression crumbles to despair and horror as he meets his doom. Later, the rescuers discover the girl hiding in the bunker. Rita tried to inform her mother, but it was already too late. The poor girl had experienced the loss of both of her parental figures in the same night. The town she thought invincible had just been butchered, as the mimics slaughtered 15 o people. The nameless girl had lost everything important to her. Rita's relative took her in, and although the United Defense Force requires a person to turn 18 to join the army, Rita decided to steal the passport of a female refugee, and used her identity instead. At her age, she joined the United Defense Force with a brewing, riveting, and determined hatred for the mimics. She wanted to exterminate every last piece of those filthy monsters from this planet. Six months after she joined the military, Rita Vretaski experienced her first ever time loop. The mimics rained hellfire and destruction everywhere they went. Even the water would turn into a disgusting green color. Their purpose in life was consumption, and consumption alone while the other creatures served something for their environments, affecting the ecosystems and allowing evolution so that they could evolve. Six months into her harsh training, Rita became a part of a veteran strike force. At first, she also used rifles. Rita's exhaustion was catching up to her as she entered a state of panic. The first lieutenant, Arthur Hendricks, was a good man who cared for his subordinates. He took care of Rita and comforted the girl. 
Arthur is actually the same man who shared pointless stories so that she could divert her attention from the horrors of the battlefield. It was then Rita learned that Arthur did this on purpose. During that same mission, Rita first saw a creature that looked entirely different from the other mimics. This monster possessed a kind of transmission antenna, and upon shooting it down, Rita was transferred to her shower. Rita couldn't comprehend what had happened, and quickly learned that the time loop began right after she killed the creature. On her second loop, Rita performed a safety check, killing the monster yet again to test her theory. Without a doubt, the same happened again. Rita had found herself stuck in the time loop, unable to comprehend exactly what had happened. Many more loops passed, while the burning questions bothered Rita. She noted that each time, the creature was adapting to her attempts, making it difficult to kill in each iteration. A determined Rita noticed the changes that occurred in the time loops. It was during that time, she realized that rifles were ineffective. Rita did everything she could to find information about the mimics online. She strung together tiny bits of information, and learned from Shasta that the mimics are reported to be evolving. Rita found herself a capable weapon, strong enough to slay every single mimic that met her eyes. Rita deployed the use of her battle axe, and with every loop, she had begun to understand the true strength of the mimics, making them impossible to beat. The mimics were memorizing her abilities each time, adapting little by little. In every loop, the mimics reminded time, and reset the game altogether, allowing them a free get-out-of-jail card. The war became easier for them than it was for humanity. Going under this hypothesis, Rita thinks that there must be an absolute rule that would allow her to bend the war to her will. She had now become a part of a mental battle, remembering the fallen lives of her parents, refusing to lose her life no matter what. The news of Arthur's firstborn child is celebrated with happiness among her peers. However, Rita had experienced this celebration so many times that she had become tired of it. Suddenly, she felt an extreme headache lashing at her. The headaches got worse with every iteration. Rita found a report on the mystery of the mimics. The scientists had discovered tachyon particles, allowing faster than light time travel. The elephant in the room is how these mimics are capable of initiating the time loop without fail. Rita suddenly bumps into Shasta, wasting her memory chips on the ground. Rita is astonished, because this happened differently in her previous loop. Shasta told her that the chips were invaluable, as they recorded the data of each soldier on the battlefield. Analyzing every micro data they could find, the chip served as an excellent record for future operations. Rita focuses on her words and realizes that they are the same as those of the mimics. Shasta tells her that Rita's data is perhaps the most important, which is why she's even kept a backup copy. The word backup freezes Rita Vrataski from where she is standing. She theorizes that the antenna mimic acts like a server, analyzing and reverting time, meaning that one other backup mimic is responsible for the same abilities. Rita kept destroying the main antenna mimic, but was still looped back because of the backup mimic. Everything fit into pieces, the mimics were a giant network, a server that allowed adaptation against everything. Rita's objective was set in motion. She wanted to annihilate the network fully in a number of steps. Confronting the mimic server, Rita first destroys the creature's antenna, rendering it incapable of transmitting tachyon particles. The second step involved, destroying any backup mimics nearby, and the final step was to finish off the rest of the mimic server. Having crushed the monsters beneath her feet, Rita experiences a moment of pure happiness as she doesn't return to the past. The cycle of loops had ended after 211 unsuccessful attempts. Rita Vrataski survived until the end. However, with great victory also comes great loss. Arthur, a man who was so happy to return to his newborn, had become a sacrifice in place. Rita reflects that Arthur never even died in the previous loops, so she doesn't know why it could have happened. Rita thinks that she should have expected this. After all, they're facing a war against time manipulating monsters. She wanted to save many things, but there were always a few she couldn't save. After the battle, a top secret research team of scientists studied the time loop procedure after receiving information from Rita. They analyzed each part of her brain and learned that it was heavily altered due to the influence of the tachyon particles. Rita's discovery of this time loop had become humanity's greatest weapon of knowledge. She then proceeded to hunt the server mimics all over the world in order to stop them. Rita's strength surpassed and eclipsed everyone else's. Her goal had remained unchanged, which was to exterminate every last monster on the planet. With that goal in mind, the goddess Valkyrie of War struggled relentlessly. At the flower line base, Rita observed the soldiers in their PT session, one that Keiji Kiria was also a part of. Rita Vradaxi arrived in Japan, just a day before the operation. Her mere presence attracted the praise and admiration of many, realizing that this was the Valkyrie who slayed hundreds of mimics in Florida. 
Rita surmises that the loops don't extend beyond 30 hours. She intended to determine the injuries sustained in the first loop, and use the second loop as a real run of her abilities. However, despite what she did, it seemed that only Rita possessed the ability to loop. She spent her time in isolation, away from the others. Rita awaited the battle ahead. Her preparations were stellar. She could persuade others with the art of small talk that she picked up from Arthur. It was Rita's way of confirming that if someone answered her question before the beginning of the battle, it would imply that they'd also experience the time loop. That person would inevitably free her from the curse of the time loops on the battlefield. However, three years after succeeding in her first time loop, Rita traveled the globe, unable to find anyone like her. She finally conceded and thought that it was her own fate to pursue the madness of her life. Rita's headaches also got worse, and she was surprised to see the soldiers training. Instead of resting a day before the battle, Rita made an appearance among those soldiers, a gut feeling that she chose to pursue, instead of spending time by herself like she usually did. At that moment, she spotted a man intently glaring at her with firm eyes. Rita could tell through his eyes alone how much hell he would have faced. Rita's brain compels her to coordinate with her body. She slides past Keiji and asks why he's been staring at her. Keiji states that they'll talk after the training. Rita couldn't comprehend why she wanted to talk to this strange man. After the training, the man walked towards her with a confident stride. She observes the tiniest shift in his movements, realizing that this guy is no newbie. She glances at his hand, a number written on it states 159. Confused, Rita asks for information. In response, the gloomy young man tells her that he should answer Rita's question. She's shocked and confused. The young man responds to her question, a question that he would have received tomorrow. Keiji smiles and confirms the custom of green tea in Japan. A sudden moment of euphoria, hope, and sadness envelops Rita. Tears stream down her eyes as she faces a man who could finally understand the hell she had been through. Rita sobs endlessly as a delicate girl, instead of the ruthless Valkyrie people remember her by. Keiji responds to her question regarding the number and claims that it's how many times he's looped in his life. Rita understands immediately. The following day, in their battle, the same sequence follows. Keiji is sent a backup and thinks that his misery will finally end today. He has to put everything in this fight, awaiting the mimics to come. Rita joins Keiji, surprising the 17th company. Rita borrows Keiji from his unit. Both of them engage the enemy, and even though there are hundreds of mimics before them, both Rita and Keiji have become monsters in the war. Their movements were completely in sync with each other, despite never having trained together. Rita tells him to take down the server while she takes care of the backups, as per the sequence. Thanks to the information he received from her, Keiji learned that Rita had originally defeated the Mimic server. The Mimic specifically hunted Keiji, which is why he couldn't escape from anywhere he went. The time loop process repeated on his every death, as the Mimics ensured to break Keiji's will. Finally, they managed to locate the Loath Mimic server, which created the loop. Keiji channels the hatred, frustration, and anger into this one moment, as this creature puts his life through absolute hell. Keiji dodges its javelins and lands a critical hit, destroying the Mimic's antenna. With the antenna destroyed, Rita proceeds to destroy the backups. Keiji is to end the time loop by killing the server. The story comes to a close, as Keiji defeats the Mimic server. Psych, Keiji wakes up in his bed again, unable to comprehend how he failed at the height of success. Keiji has the same conversation with Rita, making her cry yet again. Not only that, but he also overstepped and forgot to converse in private. Rita finds him an odd person. Keiji takes her hand and keeps pacing until they're far away from the base. Rita calls for his attention and demands her hand to be let go of. Keiji realizes that the Rita before his eyes is different from the previous one. He faces the dread of meeting Rita continuously unless he frees himself out of the loop. In the vacant yet beautiful scenic view, Rita comments on the brilliance of the ocean and the sky. Rita's favorite color is blue, which makes Keiji wonder why she is wearing a red jacket. Rita apologizes for saying something normal. However, Keiji thinks that the Rita he knows has always been normal. Rita pauses for a moment and immediately catches on. She knows that they've had a conversation in the previous time loop. Keiji apologizes and states that he has a dozen questions to ask. Rita is glad because she finally gets to hear what happens in the future instead of being stuck in a time loop herself. Keiji claims that he's the one who's going to endure the pain. Rita pokes fun at him, stating that she's already endured her battle, and now it's Keiji's turn to fight. Keiji states that they should head to the cafeteria. Arriving in the cafeteria, the two of them share a table while the soldiers watch in amazement. 
Being the clumsy girl, Rita ends up eating a Japanese pickled plum, making an embarrassing face. She tries to act like the fruit isn't sour, but Keiji thinks that what she has is the low-tier stuff compared to the real thing. Rita takes it upon herself as a challenge. She grabs the jar of pickled plums and literally starts smoking them like crazy. Keiji realizes that he's been challenged by the best. Jin senses the commotion and becomes shocked when he sees two lunatics spitting out seeds one after the other. It's been a long while since the both of them had real fun and smiled. Keiji had forgotten the feeling altogether. The night before the operation, Keiji and Rita shared endless conversations about each other's lives. The conversation topics ranged from small talk to meaningful questions. In all of the loops that Keiji had experienced, Keiji never felt special. But this time loop he didn't want to lose as he had fostered a connection with Rita. No matter what, Keiji desired to overcome the obstacles that would test his fate. Keiji wakes up, questioning his location. He sees Rita and realizes that he slept in the Sky Lounge. Keiji had forgotten what it had meant to have an incredible sleep. Keiji takes note of a peculiar smell. It's actually the smell of coffee that Rita brewed. The smell of natural roasted coffee beans struck him by surprise. Keiji was used to drinking artificial and instant coffee, but this seems totally different. Rita had received them as a gift from a village she saved. She thinks that her status has some benefits every now and then. Rita brews the coffee, while Keiji promises to treat her to the best green tea restaurant after the war. Keiji affirms to her that the war will be over someday, and that he'll live to see it. In a strange way, Rita specifies that he will indeed see the outcome of the war. Keiji is about to drink the delicious cup of coffee, when suddenly, the glass window shatters from an attack. The mimics have infiltrated the base, and an entire army of them is waiting to finish them. Keiji can't comprehend how this is even possible. The javelins pierce through the glass, while Rita informs Keiji of their current situation. She tells him that the mimics are growing desperate, so this is their only way to win now. She thinks that nothing has changed about their situation on the battlefield. Keiji and Rita rush into action to get to their battle suits. On their way, an exhausted Shasta meets them, and tells Rita that both her jacket and axe are in the workshop. Rita gives Shasta her room's card to protect herself for the time being. She requests Shasta to keep this matter private and never allow entry to anyone. Before going ahead, Rita faces Shasta with a smile and thanks her. Rita and Keiji gear up for battle, thinking about how they couldn't finish their morning coffee. They observe the situation at hand. The Valkyrie vows to end the time loop once and for all. Jin catches up to Keiji with a worried expression on his face. He doesn't know what Keiji is doing in a battle suit and even informs him against the decision. Keiji states that both Rita and he will take care of the mimics. Jin pushes Keiji to just run, instead of risking his life. However, Keiji thinks that this time, he's the one in desperation to end this battle. Saying those words, Keiji and Rita rush into the fight. Having seen Rita's movements on the battlefield a hundred times, Keiji is aware of the exact movements she makes. He knows her way of thinking, and acts as the ultimate support for Rita's attacks. In a way, Keiji thinks that they're the ultimate duo, acting like a single unit. Sergeant Bartolome and the 17th Company struggle to fend off the monsters. Luckily, Rita and Keiji have arrived to save their lives. Rita announces that her squad has prepared a protection area at the hangar. She takes them to the hangar while Bartolome finds himself bewildered by the sight of Keiji and Rita. Keiji and Rita perform the ultimate team attack, inspiring and boosting the morale of the soldiers. Bartolome commands his men to follow the lead of the two forces ahead. With their base facing looming destruction, the remnants of the command force head out to the defensive perimeter. Upon reaching the perimeter, Rita and Keiji take a moment to gear up again. They think it's an adequate time to kill the server mimic. Keiji remembers the exact sequence that failed in the previous attempt. Keiji wonders if Rita has prepared a different strategy for this time. They fight against thousands of mimics and finally locate the server mimic. Keiji proceeds to annihilate the server mimic's antenna. In a twist of fate, Keiji gets slammed by Rita's axe. Rita, his own ally, attacks him without explanation. Keiji questions why she's hellbent on killing him. Rita finally explains that mimics send signals into the past using their antenna upon their collapse. Keiji pauses as he realizes what she's about to say. Rita explains that they were influenced by the time loops because each of their brains received the signals. Having gone through the loops hundreds of times allowed their brains to adapt. That is how their very own brains became receiving antennas. The painful migraines are proof of that fact. Keiji shudders and asks what Rita means. Rita explains that the only reason they got dragged in another time loop 
is because both of them are backup antennas, and only one of them is capable of escaping the loop by defeating the other. There is no fate crueler than the one Keiji now faces. It's Rita versus Keiji, and one has to survive at the expense of the other. The fight between the two veterans of war begins. Keiji barely blocks her attacks. Rita denies taking help from her special unit, wanting to keep this battle to herself. She slams Keiji left and right, tearing apart his battle suit. Keiji feels his wrathful opponent approaching. Keiji thinks that after his many deaths, it wouldn't matter a thing if Rita killed him. And yet, at the same time, he desires to stay true to the promise he made. He promises to fight against the obstacles of the world and overcome his fate. Keiji thinks that it's fine for him to lose as long as he gives it his everything into the fight. Their battle axes clash against each other, with Keiji remembering all 159 lives of constant death and struggle. He thinks that if he gave up now, they would be rendered meaningless. Keiji capably slashes off Rita's armor with a heavy attack. Both of them are warriors, defying their fate with the same thoughts in mind. Their heavy clashes come to a pause, with both Keiji and Rita exhausted of their strengths. In their final struggle, Rita launches an aerial attack, while Keiji prepares to counter her. And then, the attacks finally connect. It was without a doubt that Rita boasted supreme control over the battlefield as a goddess of destruction. Keiji only became better after studying Rita's movements with precision. She had fought the mimics all by herself throughout this time, with no one to help her. But even with that consideration, there was the fact that Keiji knew exactly when Rita would initiate each attack. Consequently, Rita Vretaski is defeated because her opponent knows everything about her abilities. She suffers from a major gash and even surrenders the fight. She deems him the victor, but Keiji doesn't know why. Rita tells him that when she first received the mimic signal, she learned something. To answer Keiji's confusion, what she learned long ago is that Keiji is the only person who would make it out of the loop. A flash of electrifying memories zooms past Keiji's mind, upon realizing that Rita Vretaski is suspected of her forthcoming death. Keiji apologizes to Rita for not being considerate of her pain. Rita thinks that he won fair and square. Keiji begs for the cycle to keep repeating, because even if they never escape, they'll always be together with each other. Rita is amused and reminds him that he'll be facing a different Rita every time. Keiji's selfish desperation ignores this, even though all he wants is to stay closer to Rita Vrataski. Embracing his face, Rita requests him to save humanity before the same fate repeats again. She tells him to exterminate the carnage of the time loops. Rita's time is short with the condition of her wound. She asks him to say whatever he wants, as she won't live for long. Keiji, mustering all of his courage, confesses his love for the Valkyrie. He promises to stay with her until she fades, just like she stayed with him at the very beginning. Rita is glad, because she also doesn't want to die all by herself. Keiji spots the beautiful sunset, while Rita calls him an emotional idiot. She states her hatred for the red skies, and eventually, Rita Vrataski, the goddess of war, meets her end. After that, Keiji kills the mimic server and defeats the remaining monsters in the base. Keiji's actions were called into question, as he was thrown in confinement for ignoring orders. However, in only three days, Keiji was awarded the most honorable medal that Rita had received. Keiji's comrades and his sergeant are all proud of what he did. They also heard that he was transferred to the US Special Forces to replace Rita Vrataski as their main line of attack. Keiji searches for his jacket, not knowing where it went. He finds Shasta, who has been busy checking it. Shasta apologizes, as someone has carved a name on his jacket. The name Killer Cage is something that the people had decided to call him, just like Rita. Shasta returns Keiji the key card to the Sky Lounge. Keiji takes the card and asks Shasta why Rita chose the color red on her jacket, because she didn't like it at all. Shasta remembered her saying that she wanted to be bold and stand out on the battlefield. Keiji realizes that the kind girl wanted to become an easy target for the mimics, so that the rest of her forces couldn't die. Before Keiji is about to leave, Shasta stops him to ask if he is perhaps an old friend of Rita. She regrets asking the question shortly afterward and apologizes for overstepping. Keiji tells Shasta that they had only met each other the previous day. Keiji enters the Sky Lounge. He could feel Rita's scent dissipating from the room. Keiji reflects on having faced more fights than any other soldier. He could do impossible things with his eyes closed at this point. While he is still alive, Keiji promises Rita that humanity will continue to thrive. He has committed his life to winning the war against the Mimics. At the same time, a sorrowful expression fills his face as Rita won't be here to see the conclusion of the war by his side. The only person that Keiji so desperately wanted to protect is now a thing of the past. Holding on to the cup of coffee that she had brewed for him, 
Keiji takes a drink. Remembering red is a color of Rita Vratasky's boldness, Keiji thinks that it should rest with her. Keiji Kiria will paint his jacket a beautiful blue, the color that Rita Vratasky ever so loved when they first met. 